Before we uh, come to preach, I want to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 23. Let's hear God's word. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting, uh, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, and for, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Be deceived. Evil compa company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness, and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In verse 20... Paul talks about Christ as the first fruit of those who slept. And so, really, I want to focus on that in particular uh, to speak about the certainty of the Christian hope. That on the basis of Christ's resurrection, believers also will hope to be raised from the dead. The Heidelberg Catechism, it's a beautiful catechism. Uh, it was... Um, made um, before the Westminster Confession uh, in uh, 1563, in fact, it has the opening question, which um, everybody loves. What is your only comfort in life and death? Your only comfort in life and death? And the answer is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is our only hope. And really, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying in this chapter of 1 Corinthians. The Australian broadcaster Clive James, journalist and broadcaster, knew that he was dying. And he was interviewed 
uh, on, the, on the television and was asked, well, are, are you afraid to die? And his answer was that he wasn't afraid to die because death is the end of conscious existence and if you're not conscious of anything after death, then there is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, that was his answer. And I suppose it shows, well, it gives the lie to what Christians sometimes think, that unbelieving people have no fear of death. He did have no fear of death. Now, whether he was right to have no fear of death is quite another question. But uh, unbelieving people can die fearlessly in that sense. They die in their ignorance. And, you know, on the other side of that, Christians can die fearfully. That's also true. Uh, we can be beset by all kinds of anxieties as we get nearer to death, as we feel the onset of death. You know, your old sins come back to haunt you. Uh, the, the guilt of your past misdeeds, uh, your errors, and all of that uh, invade your soul and make you wonder if your meeting with the Lord is in fact going to be a joyful one or an extremely distressful one. And so when you think about your sins, you're, you're never going to be happy about that. Uh, our only happiness, our only comfort in life and death is to know that I belong to my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is where we started. Of course, if Clive James is wrong, that there is conscious existence after death, he has every reason to be afraid. So our subject is the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of Christians to eternal life on the basis of of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are concerned about, and that's the essence of what I want to say to you. Uh, we, we are not here to discuss the, the balance of probabilities, whether that might be true or might not be true, uh, to weigh up what uh, people will introduce into the conversation. Uh, we are here to think about the certainties of consummate justice, uh, consummate accountability, um, of retribution, all on one side, and the reality of full redemption on the other. That's where we are going this morning for a short time. And for this, we are going to turn to these uh, verses in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to take verses 20 and 21 in turn. Um, but in verse 20, the Apostle Paul talks about Christ as the first fruits of those who sleep. And, of course, sleep is a nice way of talking about death. It's, it's a, a pleasant way. We, we use the word euphemism. It's, uh, but he means those who have fallen asleep in Christ, the dead in Christ. And... Um, so I want to, want to begin by exploring that verse, that Christ has become the first fruits of those, and look a bit into the background of this first fruits thing and see how that applies to Christ and applies to us. And then uh, I'll go on to verse 21 afterwards. So now the idea of firstborn and first fruits. Um, has quite a history in the Bible. It's, it's very prominent, in fact, and is, is mentioned often in, in the early books. And if you went through uh, the Bible, uh, you'd see reference especially to the firstborn cropping up all over the place in good contexts and bad ones. But here we, we are thinking of, of um, the, the firstborn in connection with the redemption from Egypt. That was our reading from Exodus. They just celebrated the Passover, and now God was telling them that they had to dedicate their firstborn to him. And they were not to sacrifice their firstborn to him. They would sacrifice something else in order to redeem the firstborn. But nevertheless, the firstborn of the Israelites belonged to the Lord. Israel is my son, he said. To, uh, to, to Moses, go to, go to Pharaoh, 
and tell Pharaoh this, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And you see, the firstborn is, is the head of all the others who were born. He's the preeminent one. And of all the nations of the earth, Israel was God's firstborn. They were the people of the promise. These are the people uh, who came out of that promise to Abraham in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. We are part of that, part of God's firstborn. Every believer has been grafted into the Israel of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and they are, they are favored in God's sight for that reason. They are part of his firstborn. But anyway, that's how God thought about Israel at the time. Go to Pharaoh and say, um, let my firstborn go. And if you don't, I will kill your son, your firstborn, those whom you love most, those whom you honor most, I will destroy. And so that's, uh, that's the background to the idea of the firstborn son. And uh, you know what happened, of course. Pharaoh hardened his heart, wouldn't let the Israelites go, and God visited them on that, that uh, dark, dark night when the angel of death passed over the Israelite houses and struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And from that time on, they, they remembered this great act of deliverance by dedicating the firstborn to the Lord. And they were never allowed to forget that. And then that's also translated into their harvest festivals and their harvest thanksgivings. And so, um, in, in addition to conse consecrating the firstborn, uh, the, the one that opened the womb to God, uh, they were also instructed to bring the first fruits of their harvest. It's all part of the same pattern of thinking. See, this was, this was a token uh, or a recognition of the very special relationship that they had with the Lord God. God had chosen them out of all the nations of the earth. And so, as well as dedicating their firstborn children, so they would dedicate the first fruits of their labors, which they had sown in the field. And it, all of this speaks about the relationship between God and his people. Now, these things, the, the dedication of the firstborn and the offering of the first fruits, speak of a relationship not actually based on obedience to the law. They didn't maintain the relationship by doing those things. This is what God asked of them within the relationship which he had already set up. So the relationship is a relationship of pure grace. And the obedience to the instructions are the thankfulness of God's people for it. If I go back to the Heidelberg Catechism again, the, the, the part of the Heidelberg Catechism that deals with obedience to the law of God is headed our thankfulness. And so the people are thanking God for the redemption that he has granted to them. And that's how they were to express it. It was a recognition of the relationship of grace which put them under an obligation of grace, but it also gave them the hope of blessing to come. So that's just a bit of background. The first fruit, the first fruit of the harvest um, speaks about the relationship of uh, God and his people and uh, the people to their God. And there's one other thing to say about that. The first fruit was a token of the whole thing. So when the first fruit was brought to the Lord, it was a way of saying, yes, Lord, it's not only this. It's all that we harvest from the field, all that we take from our olive trees, all the grapes that we ever pick. It all comes from you. And this is the first installment of it, if you like. This is the token of your goodness and mercy. So then we come to 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead. 
and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And just as there's an essential unity between the first fruit and the whole harvest, so there is a unity between Christ and his people in the resurrection. I mean, that's what this is really about. You see? Uh, an essential relationship between believers and their savior. But the concern here is about those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. They've died as Christians. But there's a question. What will happen to them? Because Christ hasn't come. And there was this idea abroad, especially in Thessalonica, we can read about it in the Thessalonian epistles, that because Christ hadn't come, uh, those who had died would miss out on the resurrection that came when Christ came. And so they'd be lost. Well, there, was, there seems to have been a lot of confusion about things like that. Those who have fallen asleep, what's going to happen to them? And there were some in Corinth, of course, who actually denied that Christ himself had been raised from the dead. But Paul wants to say this, as he does consistently throughout his writings, that those who are united to Christ by faith are like the first fruits and the harvest. They belong. And there's an inseparable bond between them. So that what happened to him will happen to them. And that's really the basis of our hope as Christians. We die. And we are put in the ground. And if the Lord doesn't come by that time, then we perish in the ground. That's what happens to us. Some of us are getting near to that by the law of averages anyway. Of course, we don't know what time the Lord has for any one of us. But, you know, as you get older, you think those thoughts. And it's right that you should. Young people should think them too. Shouldn't they? Anyway, we are buried in the ground. And there we lay. And in the burial service, we say, waiting until the resurrection at the coming of Christ. And so, even the body... The soul goes to be with Jesus. The spirit is with him from the moment of expiration. But then you wait for the coming of Christ. And he is the first fruits of the harvest to follow. And that's really what we're saying. Their body remains united to him and will be reconstituted a spiritual body at the time of the resurrection. And so Paul says two things here. But now Christ is risen from the dead. That's the first thing. And then he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And the second part clearly depends on the first part. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Why does he say that? Why does he say Christ is risen from the dead? Everybody knew it. Well, no, they didn't. I just mentioned that there were people who were either confused about it or who outrightly denied it. And that's why in the early part of this chapter, he goes over the facts of the matter, goes over the history. Chapter 15, verse 3, For I delivered to you, I passed on to you, uh, first of all, what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Kephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 who, of whom the greater part remain at the present. So when he was writing this down, most of those people who saw the raised Jesus were still alive, you see. And after that he was seen by James, then by the apostles, then last of all by me as one born out of due time. Now, these are the facts of the matter. See? It's not a bunch of interesting ideas. These are the facts of the matter. It's the eyewitness testimony of over 500 people. So what's the problem? Why is it that we will accept some historical testimony and not others. You know, from the ancient world, 
we, 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 uh, we pay attention to men like Herodotus and Xenophon and Julius Caesar and Flavius Josephus and all of those, and, and we construct a history on the basis of what they tell us. And um, we might question one or two details, but we don't question the thesis, you see? But when it comes to the Bible, and when it comes to what the Apostle Paul says, why skepticism takes over. And that's because there's a spirit of unbelief in every unbeliever. And that's what guides them. But over 500, most of whom were alive at the time of writing. And so Paul is saying, look at the evidence. Listen to the evidence. The business of Christian preachers is not to make up arguments, but to state the facts, to proclaim the facts. This is what it was. And so he says, now Christ is risen from the dead. That cannot be questioned. And, and we need it in order for everything else that he goes on to say to be true and applicable to us because, as he says, if Christ is not risen, then everything's a waste of time. And so here we are, really, uh, at the point where freedom from the cycle of confusion and, and, and meaningless and delusion and, and injustice even, um, personal guilt, um, self-centeredness, uh, hopelessness, all of those things, all of that is resolved at this point. Now Christ is risen from the dead. And if that were not, not so, then I'd have no business talking to you here this morning, uh, any more than Nathan or any other preacher of the gospel. If Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. Right? We are still in our sins. And those who have fallen asleep, this is the point, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, what's happened to them? They've perished. That's what he says. They've perished. It's been a total waste of time. A big contract, if you like, a delusion. And uh, there you are. Clive James is as well off as the rest of us in that case, or as badly off, off right? Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if he is not raised. So you have to understand then that when he says that those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if Christ is not raised, he doesn't, he doesn't mean perished in the sense that Clive James meant it. The, the cessation of conscious existence because not only is life an active concept, but death is too. Death is an active concept. It's not oblivion, but things happen in the state of death. When you are perishing, it's called eternal destruction from the face of the Lord, but you have to give uh, uh, time for the eternal bit of it. Eternal destruction from the face of the Lord. And so, you see, everything hinges on this, apart, uh, apart from heaven and hell, things like love and mercy and justice have no real meaning. They, there is no fixed point of reference. You think of all the injustice in the world. Well, where is it going to be resolved? Does it have any meaning? And therefore, is it really injustice? If there is no point of reckoning and no accountability... So those who denied Christ's resurrection at Corinth, they weren't atheists and they weren't agnostics. Uh, they were church people, actually, who hadn't been listening to their teachers properly and not studying their Bibles enough and not praying about it enough. That's really what was going on there. And they, they fantasized uh, about things. They, they, they got puffed up, actually. They thought they were spiritually superior. They were elitists. And they had to be brought back to Christ. But now Christ is risen from the dead. But then he makes this second statement, doesn't he? And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
Now, I've, do, I've done enough on, on background and stuff for me to, to say that the rest is, is pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward, see? As in his death, so in his resurrection, Christ represents his people. It's simply that. He is our representative. Paul says he was raised for our justification. For our justification. Not just for his own vindication, certainly it was that, but for our justification. Isn't God wonderful to include us in it? But you have to believe that. You have to believe it. It's, 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 no, it's no good. Say, oh, yes, that's what the Bible says. No, it has to be, that's what I believe with all my heart. Because each day I'm getting closer to my death. And what is my only hope and my only comfort in life and death but to know that I belong to my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? We have to be like Abraham. When, when God gave exceedingly great and precious promises to Abraham, what did he do with them? What do you do with the promises of God? You believe them. That's what they're for. They're for believing. And it was on that basis that he was accepted by God as righteous. So, and Paul says in Romans uh, chapter 4, doesn't he? He says, well, you know, this wasn't written for Abraham's sake only. It was, it was written for us. He said that, that faith shall also be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who, who was delivered up on account of our offenses and raised on account of or for our justification. So there you have the facts. Christ is raised. And there you have the meaning and the application of it. He was raised for us. Now, let me come quickly to my last point. And it's the, uh, the next uh, couple of verses there. So if we go back to the text, but now Christ is risen from the dead, has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So I just want us to ponder for a few minutes Verses 21 and 22. For since by man came death, uh, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. We talked about the first fruits being uh, a representation of the whole harvest. That's where we, we started way back. Well, now I want to talk to you about representation in its, its, its full orb meaning. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, in Adam all die, even so in Christ, in Christ shall all be made alive. And the, the in is the key word there. It's a little word in the Greek. Sometimes it's not even a word. It's, it's understood. And yet, there's nothing more important than that for our relationship to what the Apostle Paul is saying and for its applicability to us. You need to be well connected, basically. You need to be connected to the right people. Uh, in, in South Wales, where um, uh, certain uh, people rose through the ranks and became local dignitaries and so on, there was, um, there was always some scandal or other about, you know, who was pulling the coattails of so-and-so and, and, and getting preference for it. And you need to be connected to the right people. It's not, it's not what you know, but who you know. But here, it's about who you know. And only one you need to know. And that is Christ. That is Christ. But there are two ins, and there are two alls. All in Adam, and all in Christ. The reality is, and it, it, this, this applies to every last one of us and all the people who haven't come here this morning, they're all in Adam. All connected to him. He's our first parent, isn't he? That's the fact. He's our first parent. And he, he was a representative figure. See? Just like our MPs represent us, whether we like it or not. 
Well, Adam represents us, whether we like it or not. And, and we can't escape from under that. That's the fact of the matter. That's why it's necessary to have uh, a doctrine of the resurrection of, of believers. Because if we didn't have that, we'd all die in Adam. That's what the Apostle Paul is about here this morning, you see. So there are two alls, all in Adam and all in Christ. And uh, it's, it's all about being connected. We are all terminal cases. You've got to face the fact, haven't you? From the moment you're born into the world, you're a terminal case. We can't, we can't put a time on the term. Only God can do that. But, but we will all die. We will all die. See? That's, that's a fact. And we will all die because we are in Adam. For as, as in Adam, all die. It was by man, by the first man, that sin came into the world and death came by sin. And all have sinned. Anyone here hasn't sinned? Anyone here kept the whole law of God? I'm not talking about the law of the land, but the law of God. I'm glad no hands have gone up. And death is the consequence of breaking God's law. And so it's appointed to every one of us to die because we are lawbreakers. We, we have broken covenant. Uh, we are following in the footsteps of our first father, Adam. He broke God's law in that wonderful setting of the Garden of Eden. And he thought the rules were prohibitive and they'd spoil his, his enjoyment of life. Spoil his enjoyment of life. Of every tree you may freely eat, except for one. And that's the very one. Kids are like that, aren't they? Right? Right? You know, the very thing, the very thing that they're not to, not to do or not to have, they, they go for. Well, we all do. We all do, right? And so, by man came death. But by man came the resurrection from the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I want to ask you this morning, I don't know you, you see, so I have to ask. Are you still in Adam or are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Are you connected by faith? Are you joined to him by faith? Is he or his, is his resurrection the first installment, the representation of what you yourself will enjoy when your life in this world ends? Even so shall all in Christ, all in Christ, be made alive. I said before, I, I think about death. I often think about death because I'm old. Uh, and I have to say that I didn't think much about death when I was young. It's sad, really. I think it's a good thing to think about dying. And uh, you think about your life and the, the, the things that you regret. And... You know, that, that's always repeated whenever I come to the Lord's table. That's a process that I go through. I don't, it's not a process of ours, but, but when I'm confronted by, by the tokens of our Lord's sacrificial death for me, then I think about those things, don't you? I always have Psalm 130 in my mind at that point because it, it saves me from being consumed by self-pity and guilt. You see? That there is mercy with you, that you might be feared, and plenteous redemption. Thank God. And so, the thought of meeting God can be fearful if we lose sight of our relationship to Christ, or if we have no relationship with him at all. The Bible calls him the forerunner, the one who has gone before he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and take you to where I am. And that is the Christian hope. Why? Because he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And if you 
if you have that relationship with him, if you know that you believe, however falteringly, if it's saving faith, it's saving faith. And, and it will keep you till the river rolls its waters at your feet. And then he'll bear me safely over, made by grace for glory meet. That's, that's the certainty of the Christian hope. And I would like you to think about these things and reflect upon them. And if, 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 you, if you are in Christ, thank him every day. Thank him that the multitude of your sins will not shut the gate of heaven. But his sacrifice has opened it for you. And his resurrection means that he'll be waiting there to greet you. And if you don't have that, if your sins are shutting you out, then appeal to him because he's been there and done it. He went all the way to the cross of Calvary. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree that I being dead to sin might be the righteousness of God in him. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen.